go. Okay, hi everybody, welcome. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jill Simmons. I'm gonna be your instructor today. And I just always like to share a little bit about my background before we get started. So I've been cooking or teaching cooking classes now for well over 20 years. My specialties are baking and French cooking. Our menu today is inspired by, by France, specifically uh, the Provence region of France. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, in class. My husband and I have been fortunate to have taken several trips now to France, uh, four to be specific. And we're always really inspired by the culture and the cuisine and the wine. And so today my husband, Walt, is joining me. He's gonna be introducing two different French wines that we're gonna be pairing with the menu that we're making today. So I know some of you are um, cooking along with me and I just wanted to uh, go over the format of the class, kind of what I have planned. We're gonna start on the Rui. I'll talk about um, the Rui a little bit more when we get to that recipe. So that's the sauce that we're serving with our seafood and papio. We'll make the Rui, get that in the fridge, and then we'll start working on the ingredients for our seafood and papillot. And there were some things we needed you to do ahead, like slow roast the tomatoes, but some of those ingredients we'll be working on uh, together. So we'll assemble all of the ingredients that we need for the seafood and papillot. We'll then get our potatoes started, and then we'll come back and we will assemble our parchment packets. I'll show you how to do that. And we'll drain our potatoes, get our seafood into the oven, and then it'll be Walt's turn to come up and talk about the two different wines that we've selected. Um, at that point, the uh, seafood will be coming out of the oven. I'll show you how to serve the parchment packets with the Rui and the potatoes and our, our wine, and then we'll have time to answer any questions that you might have and wrap up um, our class. So that's the game plan for today. So the first thing we wanna do is make our Rui. We asked you to mise en place your ingredients. That's a French term. Mise en place means to assemble ahead of time or put in place. So you should have your ingredients assembled for the uh, Rui with the exception of the garlic. There was something I wanted to show you um, about preparing the garlic uh, for our uh, recipe. So I thought we would do the garlic together. I'm using a food processor to make um, our Rui. If you don't have a food processor, you could use a blender. You can also um, make it by hand uh, using a metal bowl uh, and a whisk. So one thing that's really important about our Rui, basically what we're doing is we're making a mayonnaise. Just a second. My tomatoes are done. So just give me one second. I'm going to run to the back and get my tomatoes out of the oven. I'll be right back. So here are my slow roasted tomatoes that came out of the oven. We'll talk about those in a little while. They were in the oven for an hour um, and 15 minutes and they smell wonderful. So I'm gonna just set them over here and we'll come back to those in a little bit. So let's come back to our Rui. So I was saying basically what we're doing is we're making a mayonnaise that we're embellishing with different ingredients. Now, for you to be successful in this recipe, one thing that's really important is to have an egg. The egg that you're using needs to be at room temperature. 
And why that is, is that a room temperature egg is gonna be better able to absorb the olive oil that we're adding to make an emulsification. Uh, so that, that's one thing that's really important. If you find maybe that's something you forgot or you're running short on time, one little trick to warm up eggs is just to put the eggs in a bowl of warm water with the shells and just let them hang out in the warm water a little bit and that'll help to warm them up a little faster. Uh, you want them to be about between 70 and 80 degrees. So before we start, let's talk about our garlic. So you guys probably know this trick as far as taking a head of garlic, the flat edge of your knife, and giving it a little smash, right, to help to remove the peel. And sometimes you have to give it a pretty good whack to loosen that peel. But what I wanted to show you, and this was something that one of our teachers in a um, cooking class, hey, well, there's a waste basket um, that I was using in the back, if you could grab that for me. Uh, a teacher that we had, a cooking school teacher, um, we took a class in Paris, showed me, um, and then it was interesting what was there too. What was interesting is I have a cookbook called Around My French Table by Dory Greenspan, and she talked about this very same technique. Um, so what I'm getting to is you, if you take your garlic clove and cut it in half lengthwise, and I know it's going to be harder for you to see, but in the middle, there's a piece, this has like a little bit of green to it. It's the germ or what's uh, referred to as the sprout. If you remove that piece, you can use a paring knife too. If you remove that little piece, it helps the garlic to be less bitter. And I actually think it helps to be able to better digest the garlic as well. So that's something that's commonly done um, in France. If it's not that pronounced, then it means that your garlic is young. You'll probably see that in the springtime. Um, so then you don't have to worry. And then in your recipe, it says to press your garlic, but you can also grate the garlic as well. And I'm going to go ahead and grate my garlic and add that to the food processor here. And we'll start adding our, our other ingredients too. So as I'm peeling and grating, and you'll be doing the same thing, let's talk about what's Rui. What exactly is that? What's the name mean? So Rui, if uh, Literally, literally translated in French means rust. And culinarily, this is a sauce that has a lot of garlic in it. It has, um, we're using red pepper flakes, but traditionally you could use fresh uh, chili peppers. And when it's blended together, the red chili peppers, the fresh red chili peppers will give it kind of a rust color. Our brewery today is gonna to take on the color of the saffron, so it's gonna be a beautiful golden color. So brewery is commonly served with bouillabaisse. Now we're making seafood in papillote, but a lot of the ingredients that we're using with our seafood today are reminiscent of what you would find in a traditional uh, bouillabaisse. So I thought it would be fun to make a rui, and then we're serving um, our two dishes with potatoes. So we have the seafood and the rui, and we had potatoes the last time uh, we were in France, we were in Nice, and we took another cooking class, and our teacher made a bouillabaisse 
it was a chicken bouillabaisse and she made Rui and then served it with steamed potatoes. So that's where I got the inspiration of doing potatoes. If you've had a bouillabaisse, usually it's served with um, toasted baguette slices. And so you dip it into the soup base, the bouillabaisse, and you can also spread Rui on it. So I guess the point here is, is Rui is actually good on a lot of different things. Um, so I have my garlic and then we have the room temperature egg and I'm adding that into my food processor. We have our red pepper flakes and I'm just gonna crush these between my fingers here to add to the garlic and the egg. And then we have our saffron and I'm gonna talk more about saffron when um, we get to the seafood and papillote recipe but I went ahead and added the saffron. I crushed it between my fingers and added it to the lemon juice. You have about a tablespoon of lemon juice here. And you can see how the liquid will draw out the color of the saffron as well as the flavor. So you always, want, when you're using saffron, you always want to add it to a little bit of liquid to draw out the flavor and the color. And plus crushing it, will help to release the, the saffron, the flavor of the saffron as well. So that goes in to my food processor. And then what we're gonna do is get this going. So I'm gonna turn this on. And let this mix just a little bit. So the other trick to making our Rui, or if you're just making a basic mayonnaise, I have three quarters cup of olive oil. You want to slowly drizzle the olive oil in. Once the egg starts to absorb that olive oil, you can add it, it'll start to thicken. You actually, that you'll hear a change in how this is mixing. Once it starts to thicken, you can go ahead and um, add it a little faster. Do I have anybody that's making this by hand? Or is everybody using a food processor or a blender? Okay, all right. So we're just gonna slowly, like just kind of droplets in a thin drizzle. To get this going. So it takes a little patience. Hey Walt, yes. do you want to come up here? I'll have you hold up a couple pictures. So see those two pictures? I know you guys are concentrating, but um, I have it, I printed out a couple pictures. One is Walt's making our Rui and Nice. And they're using a mortar and puzzle. So one person's adding the oil and then he's stirring and you're supposed to stir it. If you're using a puzzle, stir in the same direction, right? Yeah, stay on the left side. Right. And then the other picture is what it looks like when we're all done, right? This will be easier to see than the other one. I'm going to walk around, get that a little closer. Does that help? Okay, you're good. Okay. Okay, so just be patient and slowly drizzle. and this will start to thicken up. Thank you. So I like using olive oil. You could use a more neutral flavored oil, um, but I think the fruitiness of uh, the olive oil really complements uh, the seafood and uh, the potatoes. And it, it's a little richer. 
Jill, I'd also like to say that you're getting a really healthy fat when you're ah. using olive oil. Um, so it's such a good, good thing to use. So I would recommend using the olive oil anyway, just because of the um, health benefits. Yeah, good, good point. And I use a little bit more expensive um, olive oil when I'm making like raw sauces, salad dressings, you know, pesto, arugula, a homemade mayo. And then I still cook with olive oil, but kind of the idea is, is that the heat when cooking will break down the flavor a little bit um, of your olive oil. So I'll use one that's still good quality, but a little less expensive. And I can hear that my mayonnaise is starting to thicken, or my ruby, I should say, is starting to thicken up. And then after this, we'll add um, a little bit of uh, salt. Hey, Walt, you know, on, in the back of the kitchen, on the top, there's mise en place bowls. Could you just grab, you know, one that would fit about a cup of uh, ruby for me so I can transfer it? And this will last about a week. All right, so let's take a look. At it. Yeah, this looks really good. Ah, and look at that color. Isn't that beautiful from um, the saffron? It's just like a beautiful, rich, um, golden color. Thank you, that's perfect. Um, I'm gonna add just a little bit of salt. And then I'm gonna give it, I'd say I'm just putting like maybe about a half a teaspoon in my hand. I'm gonna just give it another little spin and then we'll take a taste, kind of see how, how we're doing. Oh, that's good, Lori. <laughs> I'm excited. All right, yeah, no, I think that's really good. Ah, it's, I love the lemon and the saffron and the garlic. It's really pungent, but you'll be surprised. I know like our seafood is a little more mild. It's just like all three of these components just go so well together. Now the chili flakes, are those added? I did. Okay. I added the chili flakes. Yeah. And um, Emily is asking, do you let it run through the food processor until it thickens? So see the consistency of how mine is. So I added all my olive oil in a slow, steady stream. And that's the consistency that you should have. Did so that answer, answer a little that? bit, a little bit um, lighter than a mayonnaise, a little bit thinner than a mayonnaise, a little bit thinner because you're adding, you know, you've added other ingredients to it. But it's also going to, um, as it sits in the refrigerator, it's going to thicken up too. Put that in. And that color is just amazing. I don't want to waste any. Okay. All right. So was everybody successful? You guys are doing okay? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and cover this and get it in the refrigerator. We can go ahead, um, you can kind of clear your workstation and we'll start in then on the ingredients for our seafood and papio. At this point, go ahead and leave your seafood in the um, refrigerator, but you can pull out the rest of your um, ingredients. Jill, do you need a bus tub? 
I have one over here. Okay. I'm so used to the old way where we would put all our dishes on the tray and somebody would take it to the to the There's back. nobody there's nobody there anymore. No, and I have a wall. <laughs> I'll start making him do dishes. <laughs> uh, he does at home. He does a good job for sure. Okay, I need to go cover my Rui and I will be right back. Okay, so for your seafood and papio, we're gonna um, zest our oranges, work on our thyme, we're gonna add saffron to the wine and chop our shallots. And then I'm also gonna show you how to make the parchment paper uh, hearts for um, our uh, packets. So in papio, that means to bake in parchment paper. So it's a French technique. It's very simple. Um, the, ni <clears throat> the nice thing about it, it's a really good preparation for seafood because the seafood steams in its own juices. Um, so it keeps the seafood really moist. It's really flavorful. And then it makes for a really pretty, pretty presentation as well. When you take the packets out of the oven, the parchment kind of puffs. Um, and then I'll show you how to serve it. You would serve the parchment packet to your family or your guests. You'd make a little slit in the top of the parchment paper um, with scissors, but then the guests can pull back the parchment paper to reveal um, the content. So it's actually kind of fun. And this is a recipe to, um, that's good to do with kids because they really like making the parchment paper hearts. I used to make this recipe um, all the time with my niece uh, and we would use salmon. Um, so we would do like a bed of veggies and a piece of salmon and then enclose it in um, our parchment paper hearts. And what's nice too is you can do it ahead, this preparation ahead. And it only takes like about 10 minutes, so it doesn't take very long um, as far as the, the cooking time. So in your recipe, um, you should have measured out a quarter cup of wine. So you have a quarter cup of white wine, yay. Emily's got hers. I went ahead and used the Chardonnay that Walt selected um, to serve with this. He's going to be introducing a Chardonnay and a Rosé. Both, both are French wines. So that kind of plays into the general rule. Um, you would use a wine um, to cook with that you also would drink. It doesn't have to be something really, really expensive, but something that you enjoy and that would complement the food. So out of the two, the Chardonnay and the Rosé that we're serving um, later uh, at the end of class, I would I'd definitely go with the, the Chardonnay to use to cook with. And then what we want to do is then take our saffron, crush the threads, nice large pinch, crush the threads and add it to our wine. So the same thing we did for the Rui, um, where we are adding the threads to our liquid so that it draws out the flavor and color of the saffron. Now saffron is actually the most expensive spice in the world. And the reason why is it's very labor intensive to cultivate. 
Um, it comes from a purple crocus flower and there's three stigma per crocus flower. It has to be picked by hand and it takes something like 14,000 stigma to make one ounce of saffron. So the good thing is, is that a little bit goes a long ways. Um, it can be described as kind of having like honey, grassy, um, sweet notes. Um, if you use too much, it can be kind of bitter or metallic. Um, so again, a little bit goes a long ways. We oftentimes will associate saffron with Spain, but um, a lot of the world's supply of saffron is now being grown um, in Iran. Uh, you want to definitely buy the threads. They're going to last longer. They're going to retain their potency. Um, don't buy the powder. Uh, and saffron's used like in paella, risotto, um, our seafood in papio, uh, or a seafood uh, bouillabaisse. So the next thing I want to talk about, this wasn't on your shopping list, but I wanted to introduce this to you. Probably nobody has perno up in their liquor cabinet, but it is a traditional ingredient that um, is used in bouillabaisse. If you did have perno on hand, you could add a tablespoon to your quarter cup of wine. It's a French liqueur. It um, is made with lots of herbs. It has like a hint of licorice. It has kind of a yellow golden color to it. It's also served as an aperitif in um, France. Uh, it's oftentimes you'll get like a tall chimney glass with ice, a little bit of perno, maybe about a uh, quarter amount um, in the glass and then a pitcher of ice water and you add it to the perno because it is the flavor is so intense it helps to kind of soften the flavor of the perno. It also has fennel in it, um, and it's, it's consumed as, a, as an aperitif. So it's very nice. It complements the seafood. So if you enjoy this recipe today and you go to make it again, I would strongly encourage you to get some perno and um, add a tablespoon to your wine and saffron uh, mixture. I think it really um, brings out the notes of the seafood. Um, so it's definitely worth trying. And it's one of those things that'll keep in your, your liquor cabinet for um, a long time. I'm going to continue on to um, working on our ingredients. And then we'll come back to the uh, parchment uh, hearts. I'm just so going to wipe off my um, microplane. Yes. Are, you, are you adding the perno to the one you're making? Can I? Yes, what? absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am adding the perno. Good. Yeah, I will add a tablespoon here. I just didn't add it to um, your shopping list because I didn't want you guys to feel like you had to spend thirty dollars for a tablespoon of perno if you know wasn't something you were going to use again. <laughs> Lucy gave me a thumbs up. If you ever want to borrow some, Lucy? I have it on hand. Okay, so we're going to zest our oranges. Um, as we're preparing our ingredients here, um, we're making four packets. So we're kind of dividing the ingredients or think about dividing the ingredients um, by four. So you want um, about two teaspoons of lemon zest. So it'll be a half a teaspoon per packet. So the zest from uh, two oranges should be about right. And I don't zest like a lot of people do, but this makes more sense to me. If I'm running my microplane on my orange where I can see what I'm doing. So I'm just getting the zest and not the white pith. And then the, the zest in our oranges, it just has all these beautiful essential oils that are really gonna add a lot of flavor. And I would say when, you know, I, I did a, I hadn't made this recipe in a while, so I wanted to recipe test before I submitted the recipes. And when we were enjoying our seafood and the rui and the potatoes, and then of course we were sipping on both of the wines, right? Um, just wanted to make sure everything was really good for you guys. Um, one of the things that I noted was just what a difference 
um, the orange zest made in this recipe and just kind of the sweetness of the orange zest really paired nicely well with the wines, but also just the garlicky kind of spiciness of the Rui and it's just really um, delicious. Okay, Walt, I'm gonna ask you, can you just run and get me another mise en place bowl? Thank you so much. Okay, so I think I'm good on my zest. Um, and then I'm gonna start in on my shallots. So shallots are a member of the, thanks, that's great. A member of the onion family. They're a little more mild in flavor. And they're used a lot in French cooking. Uh, when you shop for shallots, you'll see they have kind of like a thin, papery skin. We'll help you with the dishes, Lori. Um, <laughs> we get a lot of mise en place bowls. Thin, papery skin. Sometimes they're almost shaped more like a, a head of garlic than an onion, per se. You'll have sometimes two different parts, but sometimes three or four. Um, so you're going to go ahead and pull that apart. And then I just cut off the tip. It makes it a little easier then to peel back the papery skin. The nice thing is, is you have a flat surface to work with. And then I'll show you uh, how I, what I do to um, go ahead and finely chop the uh, shallot. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work to get off that thin papery skin. So what you wanna do, you have the flat piece of your shallot, and this is just like how I would prepare an onion if I cut my onion in half. I'm leaving the root ends intact, and then I'm gonna make horizontal slices, but I'm not cutting through that root end. That root end's gonna hold the layers apart, and I'm gonna take the tip of my knife and make vertical slices, and then you can go back through and make your dice. And then I find with shallots, oftentimes you just have to kind of go back through to make a little bit finer of a dice. So you want to end up with about a quarter of a cup of shallots. So each parchment packet is going to have about a tablespoon. So I'm just going to keep working away. So I mentioned um, our seafood in Papillote is reminiscent to uh, the flavors that you would find in um, a seafood uh, bouillabaisse. So bouillabaisse is from the Provence region of France. It um, originated in a port town called Marseille and how the whole recipe first started is you had the fishermen going out, they would fish, bring back their catch, and at the end of the day, it was anything that was too ugly, spiny, small, would get thrown into a soup pot, and they would add a little water, some wine, maybe some garlic, and cook the seafood stew. And then over time, ingredients like tomatoes and the perno and the saffron became a little more sophisticated. The orange peel were then um, added uh, to the original uh, recipe. So here with our papillote, our seafood and papillote, we have the orange peel, the tomatoes. We're using shallots instead of onions. Our orange zest. They would also add herbs. We're adding, you know, a little bit of thyme. Our wine, our perno. 
and our saffron. Okay, I've got one more shallot to go. How are you guys doing out there? Okay. I'm having, I'm struggling getting the paper, the skin off of the shallots. Yeah, sometimes that will happen, especially when they're small like that. Yeah. Okay. All righty. So I'm doing my. slices, then taking the tip of my knife, doing my vertical slices, and then going back through. So one thing, um, I wanted to share when we did our cooking class in Nice, I thought was interesting. I mentioned our teacher did a chicken bouillabaisse. And even though Nice is right on the water, she was explaining to us that fresh fish there aren't as prevalent because the water's warmer. Um, so she went ahead and then switched up the recipe using uh, chicken thighs instead of uh, fresh seafood, and it was delicious. All right, so we're getting there. So our time, your recipe calls for four sprigs of thyme. So what we wanna do is just strip the stems Sometimes they're a little tender, but you should be able to strip the leaves off of the stems. And then you can just go ahead and leave the thyme leaves whole. And we'll sprinkle that over our fish at the end. And thyme is a member of the mint family. It has kind of a lemony, minty flavor and aroma. And it's one of those herbs that's an essential herb in French cooking. I just love it. I think it's my, my favorite herb. And it goes so well with so many different things. Oh, and Lori, I remembered to bump up the oven. So we're at 400. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So my thyme leaves. So what we're doing when you assemble your ingredients ahead of time, there's a French term called mise en place, which is always a good thing to do. It just makes um, baking or cooking just a little bit easier. And we're getting all of our ingredients in place because we're actually going to form like a little assembly line to put our parchment packets uh, together. So I'm going to let my ingredients hang out over here. We'll start making our parchment hearts. We'll get our potatoes going. And um, I also need to show you the seafood. We'll work on our seafood as well. Maybe we'll do our seafood and then get our potatoes going. Okay, so let's work on our hearts then. So there's a couple different ways you can go. Um, my preference is the parchment sheets that are pre-cut 
It makes it a little bit easier and they're flat sheets so they don't roll up on you when you're trying to work with them. Um, we were out of the pre-cut sheets. So I just went ahead and used, I had um, parchment baking paper that came in a roll. So it's already 12 and a half inches across. Um, and then you want it to be 16 inches long, all right? So 12 and a half by 16. You would take then your parchment sheet after you've measured it and make a crease and fold it in half, okay? And then you're gonna get your scissors and we're gonna make a half heart shape so that when you open it up, you have then a heart. So, you know, think back when you were in elementary school, right? And you're making paper hearts for Valentine's Day. This is why this recipe is so much fun to do um, with kids. And it doesn't have to be perfect. So I'm gonna start, I have the edge that is folded, the crease to my left. Hey, well, my wedding ring's in there in a little Mucin Plus bowl, will you get it for me? I took it off. You'll see it, it's on the counter. I just thought of it. I don't want to leave that. It's a big sparkling diamond. <laughs> I got it after 30 years of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. It is. It was Walt's um, mom's diamond. Uh, and we had it put in a setting. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, don't want to forget that. Okay, so you're going to work with the crease facing to the left. You're going to start at the bottom point and you're just going to work, work your way around and come down like you would if you were making, somebody already did their heart, like if you were making half of a heart. Beautiful. So I'm going to start cutting and you're going to go, you're going to go wide to the edge because you want your parchment paper packet to be pretty big and then come around. That's where you're making your curve. Like so. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. And you could use this as a template for your others, or you can just do one at a time. You could stack the others. I think you could do it all together. So you could either use this as your template. I think that's what I'm going to try to do. Okay, that works pretty well, I think. So I have all four of my hearts. Okay, so we're just going to let those kind of stand by. I'm going to go get the seafood because I want to talk about that a little bit. And then we'll start our potatoes before we start in on assembling our packets, okay? So I'll be right back. So for this recipe, we're using shrimp, sea scallops, and Lori got a nice piece of um, halibut here at the uh, co-op. And we asked you to devein the shrimp um, ahead of time, but I have one that I saved just in case uh, 
you wanted to see, you probably have the same technique as me. Um, so here you have your shrimp. These are wild shrimp. I also buy, and I don't think it's a sheet, a cheat is the um, frozen shrimp that we, I think it's Northern Chef is the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, they're beautiful, large shrimp. It's like between 16 to 20 shrimp um, per pound. And they're already peeled and deveined for you. And uh, they thaw very quickly just under running water. So that would be something you could get as well. So to devein your shrimp, this is something you want to do when it's larger shrimp because what you're actually doing is removing the digestive tract, which can contain a little bit of grit. Plus, it's not that pretty um, to see. It's not very appetizing. So it's just kind of a nice thing to do to go ahead and remove it. And you can just lift it out. Um, using the tip of your uh, paring knife and your finger. So I went ahead and deveined my shrimp before our class started. Um, I wanted to show you with the scallops. Um, these are beautiful sea scallops. So we have four, one for each packet. Um, on your scallop, Sometimes you'll see a little piece here on the side, and it's referred to as the foot on the scallop. You can lift it off with your fingers, and I go ahead and remove that piece because it tends to be a little tough and it's not very flavorful. So three of the scallops here that I have had that little foot and then one of them didn't. So you want to go ahead <clears throat> and take that off. And then for your fish, you can go a couple different ways. I'm going to get a uh, mat. You can leave the skin on. And it comes off really easily once the fish is cooked, but it does look prettier if you can go ahead and remove it. Um, plus then it's a little bit easier to cut the fish up. Um, we're gonna cut this in about two ounce portions. So you should have a piece of fish that's about eight ounces. Um, so this is a nice piece of halibut. You want a firm fish. Um, it's nice that it's thick because it um, will uh, not be overdone. Uh, cooking it for 10 minutes, um, it'll be nice and moist. Uh, and then I started uh, removing the skin where I just got my knife up under the skin. I use uh, gravity to help me so I'm pulling pretty tightly on the skin as I'm cutting, slicing with my knife. And then this makes it to where I'm removing the skin, but not, not slicing away any of that beautiful fish. Okay, so that came off pretty easily. It also helps to have a good, good sharp knife. And then I'm gonna go ahead and cut this in about two ounce pieces here for each packet. And I can just add that, actually I'll put it here. Okay, so we have our fish ready to go. So let's just check our recipe. I always like to do this when I'm picking at home or in classes, just to make sure we have everything. So we have our wine. I added a little perno, our pinch of saffron. I have my shallots. I have my white fish, my shrimp, my scallops. Um, we'll 
I'll talk about the tomatoes here in a second. I have my thyme, I have my orange zest. We're going to um, salt and pepper. Uh, and then I too, with seafood, just kind of a general rule, your seafood should be sweet smelling. It should smell of the sea. And you want to look for like with your scallops, like they have a nice moist sheen. That's, that's what you want to look for. Um, two, I'm spoiled because I shop here at the co-op. They have a great um, meat section and fish counter. And when you talk to them about uh, asking them questions, they're great as far as, you know, asking them when did the fish come in? You know, is it really fresh? Like Lori, when she got the halibut, they had like a, a whole fish in the back and they cut that piece for her, um, like made to order. Uh, so also it's important to go to a reliable source. So let's talk about our tomatoes. Um, so I thought this would be a fun little technique. Um, tomatoes are out of season right now. Um, plus in our parchment packets, you don't want them to get too soggy with liquid um, because we're sealing up the packets and you want them to steam in the oven. So instead of just using like canned tomatoes, I thought we would slow roast our tomatoes like we did. And that just helps to draw out the moisture, but it also intensifies the flavor of the tomatoes. Uh, you, you may have a few left over um, after we assemble everything. Um, it's, it's great. These tomatoes are great in like soups and pasta. You can even make like a little tomato vinaigrette would be delicious. You could even add a couple tomatoes to your rui. Um, because traditionally too, sometimes when you're making a bouillabaisse, you're adding some of that tomato soup base to the rui. And that would give it kind of that rust color too. So I wanna get our potatoes started and then we'll start assembling our packets. Um, I don't know if everybody had a steamer basket. I just used the insert from my um, uh, Instant Pot. Um, you could also parboil uh, your potatoes. Um, so since I'm steaming them, I'm gonna just let the water come up to a boil and then I'll add my potatoes. Um, I, we ended up using uh, the little baby uh, golden potatoes and some of them are really pretty small. So I'm just gonna use those whole and then the bigger ones I'll slice uh, lengthwise to then go ahead and steam. So the new potatoes, they're young as the name infers. And so what happens is that the sugars in the potatoes don't have a chance to fully convert into starch. Um, so then the texture is a little more waxy and then the skins are really thin. So the nice thing is, is that you don't have to peel your uh, potatoes and then the baby potatoes are great for boiling, roasting, steaming. They um, retain their shape. So they're actually the potatoes to use, like say if you were making a potato salad, because they won't, like the rest of potatoes tend to, you know, kind of lose their shape once uh, you're mixing them with other uh, ingredients. And I think my water is already starting to come up to a boil. Uh, so I'm gonna add my potatoes. I'm gonna put the lid on. Lori's gonna set the timer for um, 10 minutes. And then I'm just gonna check my potatoes. I use the tip of a paring knife to see if they're tender. So it'll probably take about 10 minutes and then we'll drain them. We'll just leave them in the, the pot after we've drained them um, and put the lid on and they'll stay nice and warm um, to serve them with our fish. 
Jill, how would you rewarm those if you were eating a little bit later? A little bit later? Like for me. Yeah, for you. You know, you could, I don't know. Do you, how do you feel about just nuking them? Maybe. I don't have them. I don't own them. Okay. Brain. So maybe just add a tiny bit of liquid to a pan. Unless you don't want to do all of them. Or, you know, you could warm them up in the oven. Okay. Do you want me to, the probably, I don't want the color to turn. Okay. So, yeah. Why don't you just warm them up on a baking sheet in the oven? That would be good. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, that'll be perfect. And they'll be really nice. You could drizzle a little olive oil on them. Perfect. And, um, they'll actually brown a little bit. They'll okay. And are okay. you ready for the timer? Uh, just about. Okay, now I'm ready for the time. All right. So for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna do one packet at a time, but at home, if you kind of, you know, have a lot of counter space, you could do, you could spread out each parchment heart and then do some shallots, some shallots, some shallots, some shallots, you know, your, your fish and just kind of go down the line. I'm going to do it one at a time just so you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to get my heart and I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to work, you see this crease, the crease here, I'm going to work on the bottom half of the heart, just under the crease. So think about it, I'm going to fold the, the top half over my fish so that you want it to be where the fish is kind of up here towards the bottom top so that you can fold this over and then start sealing in the edges. I have this pan here because my parchment paper keeps rolling up. So work about right here, just below the middle crease, okay? So I have my heart, heart like this, long ways, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Can you show that one more time, Jill? Does so the heart gonna be this way? Okay. That way, this way, okay. All right, so I'm going to take a little bit of the shallots and sprinkle that over the bottom. I'm going to take a piece of fish and a scallop. So they're kind of side by side. And then I'm going to put a shrimp on each side. Do it like that. Okay, and then I'm going to take a little bit of salt and I want a little bit of pepper. Okay. Now, I'm going to take, and I think it's okay just to leave the tomatoes whole. I'm going to drape the tomatoes over the seafood. All right, then I'm going to stir because I added the perno. You can give this a little stir just to kind yeah. of mix up the saffron. Yeah. Did you use like three tomatoes? I did three tomatoes. Okay. Thanks. And I just laid them on top. Got it. Okay. So you want a little bit of liquid, but you don't want to saturate this. You don't want it to make it to where it, you're having a hard time forming a seal or that liquid is le leaking out. 
So I have a, like a tablespoon of my wine and saffron mixture and I'm just kind of drizzling it over, over the top. Then I'm gonna add a little bit of orange zest and a little bit of the thyme, okay? So at this point, I'm going to fold my paper over my seafood. And you're going to start at the top of the heart portion, okay? Top of the heart, not the point, but the top of the heart portion. And you're going to make a fold and then you're gonna make a crease, okay? Top of the heart portion, make a fold. It's probably about like, on an angle, it's probably about one inch. Make a good crease and then fold again. Make a crease. So you're just folding the paper onto each fold and creasing and then making your way around the angle of the heart. So folding on top of one another, making your crease, folding, making a crease, folding, making a crease. I'm gonna start turning this. So are we closing all, there's no holes, right? In this heart, if we see openings, we wanna cover it. Okay. You wanna seal everything so this, so you mm -hmm. pulled the two halves of the heart together and then yes. we're folding. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's hard to see. Sorry. Joe. I know. I'm sorry too. So folding, making that crease, folding in on top of what you just folded, making a crease, folding in, making that crease, folding again. You're going to end up with kind of like a little tail piece at the end. And you can kind of twist that end and then fold it under. Jill, I'm going to answer Kiara's question. Okay. Um, yes, snapper would be too thin of a fish and it would, it would become overcooked. So you want to look for a thick, light fish and that would be something like a sea bass, a halibut, a swordfish, something that um, is a thicker cut and you really want more of a um, center cut, not a tail yeah. cut. Yeah. Okay. So there's one packet and I'm going to bake off one and not this minute. And I told Lori she could take the others home for her dinner. So I'm gonna just continue to make my packets here as you will. And then we can get these into the oven and Walt can talk about the wine. So again, I have my shallots and then I have a nice piece of the halibut and the scallop, the shrimp on each side. I'm gonna do my salt and pepper. So my niece and I up in Tahoe on family vacations, when we would use salmon, we would make like probably about 10 parchment packets. She would help me to feed all uh, my family members. So that brings back good memories. Okay, our tomatoes. And our wine and saffron and stir that up and then just drizzle. Okay. 
Okay. And then the orange zest and the time. So we did a video meet with all of that information and it's classes at. Okay, so I'm folding my parchment over. I'm starting at the top of the heart. I'm folding about an inch over, making that crease. And then folding my piece of parchment paper in on top of the first crease. And keep folding, pressing, and making your way around your heart. Your timer went off. Okay, thanks. And then tucking that little tail in underneath. Okay, so two. I'm going to check my potatoes. See, I had a little pair of knives. Yeah, those are good. So my potatoes are already done. I'm just gonna leave them in the pan and turn the heat off. I checked them with the tip of um, the, the peering knife. So maybe, am I gonna, I was thinking, do you wanna, as we're kind of working, start talking about the wine? Am I gonna be, would you be able to work? Do you want to do one wine? Yeah, you could do one wine. We can kind of listen. You can find out if anybody did did try the wine or if they, they might be uh, using the Chardonnay. Okay, so then that, that, that's the question of the day. And did anybody buy the wine? Look at Lucy, she's saying Yahoo. So uh, very good. And, and if it's okay if you didn't. So I'll try to at least describe it in a way where your mind's eye makes you have a good idea what the wine is like and how it pairs with what Jill's created here. So I'll start with a really pleasant surprise. You know, actually, Lori kind of turned me on to this. This is Bernier Chardonnay. And uh, so, you know, just a little kind of a, a geographic lesson. Chardonnay in France, generally, if you buy one, it is not, you're not going to find it on the shelf marked Chardonnay like you do in California when it's from Napa or, or from uh, Sonoma County or San Luis Obispo County, and et cetera. It's, uh, it comes from a growing region and it's, it's in the Burgundy area. That's kind of a south central France, a little north of the big city of Lyon. That's the second largest city in France after Paris. So uh, now, it's uh, if you're drinking Chardonnays from California, you're probably used to the more malolactic style, which is better known, you know, just in, in general, in general speech as buttery style. So it has kind of a, you know, creamy, uh, and a lot of, a lot of that's from malolactic fermentation and uh, an oak. So aging an oak, um, less expensive wines, using Chardonnay, sometimes the inferior quality of grapes are masked by using too much oak because initially it tastes good, but it's, uh, if you, you know, we're talking generally $10 and down or you're, 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 you're going to find better things that you're going to like between 10 and $20. Now this compared, this is kind of a one-off because the longest river in France is the Loire river. And unlike some of the wines that I described coming up from the Burgundy area where it will possess names like Cote de Bone or um, Cote d'Or, Chablis, Chervet, Chambertin, you know, all those are, the Chardonnays come from those areas and they won't say Chardonnay. This does say Chardonnay. Now, uh, it's from an area of the Loire. Now, Loire River is, and, is a long growing region of the north. The uh, most inland parts are best known for their uh, Sauvignon Blancs. Sancerre or uh, as one uh, Fumé, uh, Fouy Fumé. 
as you go downstream, as you, you get near the Atlantic Ocean, there are some interesting whites down there. Now this is kind of, a, as I say, a one-off. Chardonnay is typically not what you find there, but it, it's really, it, it has a, it's, if you're used to a California and more a little kind of a buttery quality from the malolactic fermentation, this is not it. This is, you're not going to get that with Bernier, but in, in a way that's, that's better because you have good acids, you have a nice kind of a, you, you know, you have some a little bit of minerality and a lot of citrus notes going on. And it's really nice palate cleansing Chardonnay. And you really actually get to taste what the Chardonnay grape is like. So it's not, when it's, it, it's not overly oaked. I don't, actually, I don't think it's oaked at all. It, it's, uh, it, it's going to give you the Chardonnay true grape. And uh, that acid will go well in, in the, with, with Jill's production there, it really cuts through and uh, it, it will accentuate some of the citrus notes that you, you have in, in, the, uh, in the dish. So let's see, if I borrow one of those white, like a white sheet or something, maybe that one in anything white. Walt, that, that's good. Yes. Walt, I'll have to say, um, I don't like California Chardonnays at all. This is the only Chardonnay that I absolutely love because it has no oak on it and it doesn't have that buttery it's crisp and i think it's just beautiful just the way you were explaining it All right thanks and I, I i've come to i have i mean i think there's definitely a place for california chardonnay like like with lobster or with scallops but i, I find myself gravitating toward the real chardonnays and chablis area of france and then California has some some vintners that are making on oak Chardonnays too. Yeah, McRosty comes to mind. I but like it, um, the fact that it's a lower alcohol. I right. like that too. Uh, it, it's thirteen point five alcohol, by the way. Price I believe is eleven ninety nine. So so I wanted to, to show here the color, and uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's it's uh, there, some of the California Chardonnay's malolactic will be a little more, there'll be a little more yellow going yeah. on there. So this is kind of a very, very light, kind of a pale yellow. And uh, although more, there's more color to it than you would with uh, Sauvignon Blanc, for example. So anyway, it's, when, when you have a sip of this and you take a bite, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised and uh, I'm also be excited to share a few thoughts about the next wine, which is a rosé. So I, I will step aside and let Jill take over. You know what, you're good. Well, well, well I, I, I find this really, it matches your description perfectly. It's really good. This, this oh, good, flavor. good. But as long as it's not completely refrigerated, at first it was kind of cold and it's been warming up a little bit. Ah. It has a lot more of the flavors and it doesn't have that, um, I don't know. It's the 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 old attic flavor that I don't like about Chardonnays in general. It like a petroleum. What? Like a petroleum flavor or yeah, oily? Yeah, it's got some. Yeah, it's got some kind of other thing yeah. going on. When it's warmed up a little bit, it's actually doesn't doesn't have that anymore. Good point. Too. Right, right. That's that. Lucy raises a good point because, and I, I've noticed this with a good champagne too. You know, some people want to get it when it's nice you know, just crackling cold out of the fridge. And uh, however, if you let it sit for a little bit, and aerate a little bit, all of a sudden, the, all these flavor nuances start to, to reveal themselves that the, uh, when they're overly chilled, aren't, aren't necessarily there. And uh, you learn to appreciate that. And uh, also, you know, that, you know, going off the second thing Lucy said, uh, some of the Chardonnays, some of the more less expensive ones, you find yourself with, initially the taste is, oh, okay, great, that's nice. And then you hold it in your mouth for for a few minutes, or not even not even a few minutes, maybe thirty seconds, and you'll start to notice the uh, the taste, the flavor profile starts to break down. And yes, you will have some metallic kind of artifacts in there on your on your tongue that are not exactly pleasant. I mean, not, not a deal breaker, but I mean, you're probably talking about a wine at seven or eight dollars, or um, I, I don't know, I don't want to mention a, a certain wine that sold for a really nice price out of Trader Joe's a few years ago, but that's another story. Uh, anyway, this, this is, a, it, it's very well priced. You know, good luck finding a wine like this from Napa County or Sonoma County 
for, for this kind of a price, you're probably in the 20s and 30s easily. Even, even Clarksburg, some of the prices down there are, are going up. And uh, so, I mean, I, I, I like to suggest shopping locally and contributing to the California economy. However, there's some very nice imports. One thing to mention, there are some, some uh, well, like Kermit Lynch, for example, was a negotiant. And the, the pandemic has hit it kind of hard. So there are certain kinds of wines coming out of France now and, and other parts of the old world, which includes other parts of Europe, not just France, Italy, and even Hungary, Germany, and, and Austria as examples. So this, this is an exception. Some of these wines here, the, the wines that I picked today uh, are, are not likely to run out of supply. That's, that's, that's a good yeah. point to make. Because I looked at a couple and was thinking, okay, let's, let's go with this. And then I got the word that the uh, supply chain is breaking down. So we'll have to see how that all plays out, especially with, with some of the, the uh, pandemic impacts on, on, on that side of the pond. How are you doing? Good. You can. I'm gonna. I'm gonna drain the potatoes and toss them in a little olive oil and add some salt and pepper. I put my packet that I want to show you guys that um, in the oven already as Walt was talking. Um, so I want to try to end on time at 5:30. Uh, so I think that. Let's see. I have. About yep. two minutes left on the fish, um, so that I can also show you at the end of class here um, how you would serve it, what the what the presentation would look like. So keep going. So switching gears, we're going into a rosé, and uh, rosé is one of my favorite wines for being a, a, hit, a hitter for covering a lot of different pairing. Uh, some of the most stubborn foods that that are difficult to pair wines with. If, if you can bet on, a, on one wine that might work for most cases, it's a rosé. So uh, anyway, some of the nicest rosés are from an area near, kind of near Avignon. And it, it's, you have a little town of Le Roc. And uh, in, anyway, there's a, Tavel is the town next to it. Interestingly enough, Le Roc just makes red wines, and usually GSM, that's Grenache, Movedra, and Syrah. That's common down in, in the, the Rhone area, the Rhone River Valley in the south of France, Provence, basically. Now, um, so so this comes is not from that exact area. If you go if you go towards Italy, so if if you go all the way down, the big city at the end of the river is Marseille. So that's a big kind of a, a maritime city. It's number three in population. In, Paris being number one and Lyon being number two, and then there's Marseille. Okay. So then you drive down and if you're, you're headed towards Italy and uh, there's a city called Toulon. It's really a place that's not, not on, on the, it's not on the map for tourism. It's mainly a place you, you go there as a tourist if you wanted to hop a ferry and get out to Corsica. So generally people skip that if they're, if they're touring. But if you go inland from there and you go in, into, it's a, there's a massive, it's kind of a, well, basically some of the foothills that, and they gradually increase in their height as you get toward the Alps, so toward the French Alps. So it's low enough that viticulture is still possible. And the hills around it don't rise that dramatically, but if you look at the hills around it, it's very similar to what you might see in California. And then that could be an area like Sonoma, parts of Sonoma County. So it, it, it's warm days and cool nights. And, and it's an elevation of about a thousand feet. So parasol sounds like a, an umbrella. Actually the word in French for, for an umbrella is a parapluie. But, but this is, I believe, a family name and it's, they, there's some acreage over there. And it, it has Grenache, Movedra, Syrah grapes, as well as CISO, that's spelled C-I-N-S-A-U-L-T. And then there's another one, uh, Roll, which is actually a French pronunciation for a wine that's more, uh, or, or a, a grape that's more commonly used in Italian wines in the northern part of Italy. So anyway, it's, this is a, 
this wine gives you a little more, I mean, it, it has a good linear kind of a an acidity similar to the Bernier Chardonnay, but there's also a bigger bandwidth. And this one especially, I think really comes into play with the, uh, with the Rui. I, I, honestly, if the Rui were missing, I think you, your Bernier Chardonnay would be very good and I'd be less inclined to, to, to speak heavily about, about all the positives of this. It's a great wine though. I mean, it's, I love it. And uh, it's one of, one of the best, nicest rosés I've tried in a long time. I believe it's uh, $15.99. And uh, so we have this nice little salmon color. If you go to Tavel or the really higher end, we're talking 20, anywhere between 20 and $35 a bottle for, for the really, uh, you know, the, these are the granddaddies and the rosés that come out, of, come out of Tavel. Now those will be a little bit darker in color, you know, a little, little bit more, a little more skin time. So that, there's some rosés you may have seen that are very faint. I mean, they're all, they're not quite white, but they're, they're not quite this dark either. So you take a sip of this. Uh, nice little melon minerality. They let it sit on the yeast or the least for a little longer. So you get this nice minerality out of it. And uh, I noticed if I try some of the California rosés, you, you won't have that same minerality quite to the same extent. You, you have a lot of clay soil up there. So, you know, Jill and I toured an area with Chateauneuf du Pont, which is an area that's best known for its reds. And those are some of the finest wines to come out of the, of the South of France. And uh, they're the, uh, the great, the, the grape vines grow out of rocky area. I mean, you have rocks that are two to three inches in diameter. They call them galet. And uh, as you can imagine, it's brutally difficult to try to get them established. So but somehow they figured out how to do that. And the reward they get back from that is self-irrigation. So they don't, you, you go through Napa and Sonoma and you see all these, these wheels you know, spraying, you know, just making sure there's plenty of moisture that's out there in those grapes. Well, these are all self-irrigated. So anyway, I, I recommend this wine highly. And I think it, it goes, especially if you, if you're like me, you put a little extra Rui on there, all the better. So, but Jill also raised a good point about uh, just the, the uh, amount of ingredients and the, the proportion of ingredients. And you can definitely go, go overboard and, and uh, have a un, undesired situation if you go too heavy on, uh, on the saffron and also heavy on the Pernod. That, that changes the characteristics and might actually impact negatively the, the, uh, the pairing of the wine. So any questions before I turn back over to Jill? Is that rosé, would you tend to be sweeter than a Chardonnay? Yes, it, it'll okay. definitely be a little bit sweeter, a little bit creamier, and then a lot more unctuousness. It's, it's, it's a kind of a mouth filling, uh, like, like almost like some of the wines come out of Alsace, that's up in the northern part of France near Germany. So any other questions? Okay, so the grand finale. Um, I thank have you. my, thank you, honey. I have my parchment packet that came out of the oven. Um, so when you're serving this, uh, you would want to serve it in the packet. You can cut it open for your family or your guests like so. And then at the table, they can kind of pull back the parchment paper. And so you can see the fish has kind of steamed in the wine and the saffron, and it's also released some of its own juices. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it in the parchment but as we were eating this and enjoying it, we actually just took the parchment away. So then we could kind of mix some of those wonderful flavors in with our potatoes as well. I drained the potatoes. I put them back in the pan because um, my pan was nice and hot and that kind of helps to dry, dry out the potatoes a little. I added olive oil and salt and pepper 
And then you can, I think probably what's best is just to serve the Rui at the table and then guests can drizzle some of the Rui on the fish and the potatoes and then you can keep adding a little more as you enjoy your dish. And it, looks, sm it smells wonderful. That looks great, Jill. Oh, Thank good. You. Any questions about anything that we covered today? See, I hope you enjoy the dishes that we prepared. Lucy, I'm so glad you guys joined us. Lucy's a former coworker of mine. We both worked um, for the state together. So thank you so much. Yeah. You see, it's good. We're, we're appreciate it. We're excited. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Keep checking. Um, we're adding new Zoom classes. Uh, I think we have a nice lineup for February. We're starting to work work on March as well. So hopefully we'll see you in future classes. Thanks so much for joining us today and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay.
okay. Yeah, no wonder for you to take home. Thank you. Yes. Do you want to just wash it? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. That's fine.
Do you have containers I can put those away in? Yeah, um, you can go into the tomatoes. Okay. Uh, is there a representational security on the front one? Um, no. Just a cute time. Okay, you're pretty dirty. I'm going to 